Stature is a common characteristic in FA with approximately 60% approximately of individuals experience growth abnormality. So here to present on this subject is Dr. Bradley Miller from the University of Minnesota. Uh, welcome, Dr. Miller. Thank you for being here. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, depending upon uh, what part of the world uh, people are in. So uh, um, I wanted to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. Um, I really would rather be um, at Camp Sunshine uh, rather than um, here in Minnesota in my uh, basement uh, after having to ha do yard work all morning. So um, instead of being at the beach at camp or something fun. So um, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of Minnesota and have been uh, there now for 17 years and have been involved in the care of uh, children and young adults with growth hormone or with uh, Fanconi anemia uh, for growth concerns and other issues uh, during that time. And so um, I'm honored to uh, be part of the camp this year and try and give some background about how children grow in general and um, how that's impacted by uh, Fanconi anemia and uh, bone marrow transplant as well. So I have a number of disclosures because I am a consultant for a number of companies that are developing therapies for, for children with uh, um, different common and rare disorders. The goals today are to first of all think about how children grow and understand that better, know which hormones are involved, and then more specifically focus on how growth hormone works. So we'll begin with how do children grow? by looking at where does growth actually occur, what is a normal growth pattern, when are children done growing, and how does the body actually regulate growth. So where does um, growth occur? And looks like I lost a TH there, but where does growth occur? Um, we think of the growth plates as at each end of long bones is where our body does most of our growing. And it's called the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. And so as those um, bones get longer, that's how you get taller. And that happens in the spine as well as um, the long bones. And once the bone is done growing, there's just a line there where the growth plate used to uh, live. And so um, there's only a short window of time when the body can grow. So where does it occur? It occurs at the growth plates. So this is just trying to compare a skeleton on the left of uh, uh, an infant uh, where you can see that um, the bones are still developing and some bones haven't yet formed. And then you have the adult skeleton that is completely formed. And then here in uh, another cartoon, the red shows all the areas where the growth plates or the growth occurs at the bones. And so you can see that the long bones, the, the arms, the legs, the knees, the hips are all areas where the um, bones are growing. And you can see that uh, before babies are born, they do a lot of growing. And then uh, by age 13, you've, you've done a big, amount of your growth and just have a few areas of the growth plates that are still open. And uh, by 16 to 20 years of age, most people are done growing and the growth plates are sealed and no longer have any potential growth left. This is an x-ray. Uh, many children, when they come see the endocrinologist, aside from us stealing all their blood to look at their hormones, um, we also do x-rays to look at the growth plates. and. Uh, the left hand is a common location that we look at the um, uh, bone maturity because we have a lot of different bones and growth plates. So each spot where you see a line there, this is all one bone, but that's the growth plate in it with a piece of the bone at the end. And that's where the bone is growing right there. And so you can see in the hand, there's all sorts of them. And we use the maturity of the different growth plates in the hand to help us say, what is uh, a bone age or how uh, mature are this child's bones? So we'll say a seven-year-old has a bone age of five. That would mean that uh, that child's bones are less mature uh, and has extra room to grow 
or if your bone age is seven, or I'm sorry, if you're seven and your bone age is 10, it means that for some reason your growth plates are more mature and you're running out of time to grow. This is gonna just show uh, a cartoon of what the growth plate looks like. Um, and so we're showing the end of a bone, uh, the growth plate with new bone forming this way. Um, and I'll talk about the different zones as we go through of, uh, to help understand how the growth plate works and how hormones help the growth plate uh, do its job. So we have the resting zone, the proliferative zone, the hypertrophic zone and the calcification zone. And resting zone is uh, just something where the cells aren't do anything, doing anything yet, but these cells can be recruited from the resting zone into the active growth plate to help them grow. And you only have so many cells in the resting zone that can be recruited. And when all of those cells are done, and then they move through here and do their growing, your growth plate is done growing. Um, it's difficult to get more resting cells. So proliferative zone, basically proliferative means the cells are dividing um, and multiplying. And so um, the, that's where you get a lot of these stacked up like coin cells. Hypertrophic just means the cells are getting bigger. And that's actually how the um, growth plate does most of its growing is when the cells swell up uh, and then they calcify you get the bone being longer by having the stacks of coins swell up and stretch the bone and then turn to calcium. So what's a normal growth pattern? Um, we commonly ask our kids, uh, how big are you? Um, this is my now 19 year old daughter uh, when we were at diabetes camp a long time ago. Um, but this is the standard growth curve. This one is for girls that show how um, boys and girls grow. This is the CDC growth chart that's used in the United States, but there are different regional growth charts and or, uh, country specific growth charts, as well as the WHO curve that is intended to rec uh, represent children around the world. And so you can see that at birth on the left, you have the weight down here and the height up here. And then as they get older, they should follow a channel um, along the curve and ultimately finish growing. And I'll show the, the two to 20 curve in a second. But the most important part is, is someone stay a channel, that they find a, a groove and they follow that groove. And whether that's just below the curve or whether that's in the curve, we're reassured if they're staying in a channel versus losing ground over time for either length or height or weight. This is the height curve. Uh, the previous was the length for babies. And you can see a similar thing that as children are grown, they should follow a channel. You're gonna see in here where there's a steeper zone as, as girls go through puberty, then ultimately the growth plates close and, and you're done growing. When we think about um, the curves, I, I was following the 50th percentile here, which is where a child would average, with the average child would be growing, but there are definitely tall people and smaller people. And so the bottom of the curve and the top of the curve would re represent the extremes of, uh, of growth. And that's represented in the next curve here, where this is using statistics to say that um, if you're below the second percentile, you're minus two standard deviations from the average, which is the 50th percentile or zero standard deviations. And if you're really tall, you'd be plus two standard deviations or above the 98th percentile. And so basically when we think about how children grow, um, we're all across the spectrum of uh, heights and weights. And um, uh, when you're below the curve, you're um, in the extreme, or when you're above the curve, you're in the extreme. But the important thing to remember is that statistically, somebody has to be at the bottom of the curve and somebody has to be at the top of the curve. So that's just the way stati statistics work. But when we see children be far below the curve and we don't understand why, or if they're below the curve or in the bottom of the curve and their parents are way up at the top of the curve, then we worry that that child isn't growing the way that they should be for their family. 
Um, this curve just represents a uh, how fast kids grow curve. And um, the average here is just looking at centimeters or inches per year. And um, uh, over time as an infant, age two, you're, you're slowing down, slowing down. And then uh, this one's for boys around 11 to 12, boys will kick into their growth spurt, have this growth spurt of faster growth. And then uh, as puberty goes, the growth plates will close and then you'll be done growing. The red line in this uh, picture has uh, the early blooming boys. These are boys who are having deeper voice and facial hair in middle school versus more commonly um, early high school. And these are the guys, the late bloomers in green here that may even keep growing into college. So when are children done growing? Basically when the growth plates are closed. And um, I mentioned earlier that this epiphyseal line is present in adults. And once that's fused, um, then you're done growing. And we used to think that uh, the growth plates would fuse and you'd be done growing. And now we think it's the other way around that you run out of time to grow and then the growth plates remodel and calcify. Um, on average, that's 15 years for girls and 17 years for boys. So girls are done growing about two years earlier than boys are on average. So the big part of my talk is going to be focused on how growth is regulated. And um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about hormones. And I first wanted to talk about, well, what exactly is a hormone? Um, pediatric endocrinologists um, deal with hormones and how they help uh, the body grow and, and do other things. And so a hormone is a chemical released by a cell um, or a gland. Sorry, I gotta move my box here to get it out of the way. In one part of the body that sends messages that affect cells in other parts of the body. And um, that could mean that it's affecting a neighboring cell in the tissue but it more often means that it's uh, being made in one part of the body um, and going out into the blood, through the blood, and to um, the place that it needs to do its job. So how do hormones work? Um, you have a cell that secretes the hormone, um, and then the hormone has to go to the area where it, the target cells are at. And the target cells actually need to have a receptor um, for the hormone for it to have its activity on the cell. And I tend to think of this as like a lock and a key. And so the cells have lots of different locks on them and the key only fits one particular lock to, uh, or the hormone only fits one particular lock. So if you have a cell that it uh, doesn't have the right receptor, the hormone can't do any um, job to that cell. So um, pituitary is a gland in the brain that secretes hormones. And uh, um, I never knew that uh, the, the base for pituitary in Greek uh, means to spit and in Latin means mucus. And uh, I think it's because the pituitary is right behind the base of the, the bridge of the nose. And so to get to the pituitary, you actually go through the sinuses. Um, and I think the uh, ancient folks thought that it had something to do with making um, spit and mucus and that only later did we actually realize that um, that we were uh, that they were wrong about how it works. So this is a picture a cartoon of the brain showing where the pituitary and hypothalamus live. Um, so uh, in the in the brain you can see the um, uh, little box here. Here's the nose. Here's those sinuses that I was talking about all the way back. And here's the pituitary gland. Um, and again, here's the sinuses, pituitary. And the reason I focus on the hypothalamus is because it's actually what sends the signals from all of the information the brain receives to tell the pituitary to release the hormones to the local tissues where it may also regulate hormone production. And we'll talk a little bit about the different uh, signals that come from the pituitary gland to regulate other body functions. So the main ones, uh, growth hormone, which regulates growth directly at the growth plate and also through the production of a hormone called insulin-like growth factor one. And uh, if, if you've talked to doctors about 
how children are growing, they're often measuring an IGF-1 level um, as a screening test for is your body making enough growth hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone uh, regulates metabolism and it does that through um, uh, producing thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland and uh, then that uh, hormone goes to the local target tissues to regulate metabolism. Luteinizing hormone or LH and follicle stimulating hormone or FSH both regulate puberty. Um, LH regulates it through the production of testosterone and estrogen and FSH actually regulates the fertility side of puberty uh, by helping with production of sperm and um, eggs and getting the eggs ready to ovulate. ACTH is, uh, helps to regulate the response to stress, but not the adrenaline response to stress, more the cortisol response to stress, so not fight or flight, but the later um, regulation of uh, keeping our blood sugar normal and our blood pressure normal by helping our body hold on to the salts in the blood. So as I mentioned, uh, growth hormone regulates growth and uh, um, the mice uh, standing around saying, look, somebody has to bring up the subject of growth hormones because the guy sitting next to him grew a little bit too much. So what do we mean by growth hormone deficiency? Um, a deficiency is when you're not making enough of something. And so this is uh, reduced production of growth hormone by the pituitary gland. Um, and low growth hormone actually causes low IGF-1. As I mentioned before, um, growth hormone regulates IGF-1 secretion. And um, you may hear about growth hormone stimulation tests because if we measure a random growth hormone level, it's not very helpful because our body makes little spurts of uh, growth hormone throughout the day and actually mostly at night. So you really do make your most growth hormone at night and do your most growing at night. So getting good sleep and getting to bed actually does help kids grow. Um, and it's also why we can't just take a random growth hormone level and say, is somebody making enough growth hormone? So there have been a number of different medications or um, tests developed to stimulate growth hormone release and we give the medicine and then measure the growth hormone multiple times after the medicine is given to try and capture one of those peaks. And um, depending upon your growth hormone assay and the level in your country, growth hormone deficiency is diagnosed uh, with a level less than, or if, if no levels go above 10, um, but that number varies a little bit across the world where some of them may be six and some of them may be seven, depending upon the local values. But uh, in the US, 10 is the current standard for if you have no values above 10, then you have growth hormone deficiency. So this is a complex cartoon that um, tries to bring together the different parts of the growth hormone system to just better understand what are all the moving pieces that have to work? So I mentioned the hypothalamus that sends signals from the brain. The brain basically saying, is everything set up right now for me to grow? Um, should I be making growth hormone? So it gets positive and negative signals to the pituitary gland. The positive signals will stimulate growth hormone release into the blood. There's an actual growth hormone binding protein that helps the growth hormone to get to where it should go. That includes the growth plate down here, so a direct shot of growth hormone to the growth plate. And then the biggest area related to growth is to the liver. And the reason growth hormone impacting the liver is so important is because when it sits on the growth hormone receptor there, it helps the body make IGF-1 and two other proteins that help IGF-1 get where it needs to go. So IGF-1 is secreted by the liver cells and these two other proteins are secreted by different liver cells to make a complex to get IGF-1 back out to the target tissue to that receptor on the cell that we talked about in the growth plate to help the, the body grow. So you actually need both growth hormone and IGF-1 to make it to the growth plate to stimulate growth. And so if there are problems at the liver where you're not getting enough nutrition, no matter how much growth hormone you send to the liver, you won't make the IGF-1 that you need to release out here 
and go to the growth plate. So chronic inflammation can also reduce IgF1 production at the liver or liver damage itself. So when it gets to the um, growth plate, what does it do? Um, so cartilage cells or chondrocytes move from the resting zone into the proliferative zone. And we're pretty sure that growth hormone actually encourages this step because if you don't have enough growth hormone, the cells don't move from here into the proliferative zone. And in children with Fanconi anemia, we're not sure if it's um, the defect in the Fanconi anemia complement um, uh, components or if it's directly due to DNA breakage that limits the number of chondrocytes that leave the resting zone. So growth hormone has one impact, but there are other impacts on what happens in the resting zone. Same is true in the proliferative zone. I mentioned earlier that the cartilage cells divide and stack up like coins. Um, and again, we think that DNA breakage or other um, abnormalities in the signaling system related to Fanconi anemia reduce the ability of these cells to divide or to live after they've divided so that they can stack up and uh, grow. And then lastly, um, we are still in the proliferative zone. We know growth hormone um, helps them proliferate, but we definitely know that IGF-1 is a major player in this part of the process. So um, growth hormone may stimulate this, but IGF-1 does the big job there. So I mentioned the hypertrophic zone that the cartilage cells swell up because they're producing lots of collagen. This swelling is the main reason the growth plate gets longer and IGF-1 definitely encourages this step. If you have growth hormone deficiency, um, you have low growth hormone and low IGF-1. So the chondrocytes don't divide, divide as much as they should or get as big as they should so the bone doesn't grow as long. And then if we think of the other um, abnormalities, including DNA breakage, this limits the di differentiation and proliferation of the chondrocytes, so fewer cells leave the resting zone. It is bigger, or they don't get as much bigger as they should, so you run out of time to grow earlier. So this is a cartoon that shows the, the timing of when this impacts uh, growth. And so in utero, before children are growing, um, babies are growing very fast. So this line up here is showing how fast babies can grow in, the, um, in utero as they're developing. Growth hormone isn't very important prenatally but IGF-1 is a very important local hormone involved in prenatal growth. Postnatally, you have uh, normal growth here uh, with normal growth hormone production. There's an important effect of puberty hormones, both testosterone and estrogen that, ha that stimulate an extra bump during puberty, um, in addition to their role of making you make more growth hormone in IGF-1. And again, if you don't have growth hormone or I IGF-1, you don't grow as fast. So before prenatally, we think that I, low IGF-1 is the major impact from a hormone side on poor growth. Postnatally, both low growth hormone and IGF-1 and low sex, sex steroids can impact growth. And then DNA breakage and other um, abnormalities related to Fanconi anemia impact uh, growth pre and postnatally and shorten the period of growth so that children run out of time to grow. So now we come to uh, why are children with Fanconi anemia small? Um, first, uh, I've, I've alluded to it a little bit as we've talked, uh, gone through the different pieces here. So prenatally, you have intrauterine growth retardation. Um, so that may be low levels of IGF-1 in the body, or it may be the other um, non-hormonal related reasons for poor growth. Postnatally, um, not making enough growth hormone, but also um, not stimulating the growth, the growth plate to grow as much as it should. And then a poor pubertal growth spurt because sex hormone production may be impaired 
and because we run out of time to grow because not as many cells move out of that resting zone into the growth plate to, to uh, grow. So when we think about the low hormones, um, thyroid hormone, growth hormone, the puberty hormones, and possibly the, the local growth factors can all be affected. Um, even if you're making all of your growth, all of your hormones normally, um, sometimes bones just don't grow well in response to the hormones. And as I mentioned, that could be due to DNA breakage or to other um, signaling abnormalities related to the uh, different causes of Fanconi anemia. And then the complement type definitely plays a role because there's one particular um, genetic mutation or genetic difference in individuals with Fanconi C, uh, complement group C, where there's a specific mutation that appears to affect height um, even more uh, significantly. Right now, it's not actually understood why that particular mutation is more, has more impact on growth. Um, and uh, if there are different um, amounts of impact of the different kinds of uh, mutations that cause Fanconi anemia that impact growth more severely. Why do children with Fanconi anemia have small heads? We think it's uh, some of the same reasons. Um, growth of the brain uh, is impaired. Uh, because your head size is actually very much related to how much uh, brain growth occurs. And um, some of the hormones that affect your growth uh, prenatally are um, helping the brain grow uh, before you're born and in the postnatal period as well. Um, I mentioned the growth of the long bones. Um, when a big part of how your face develops is also the growth of the the bones of the face and some of the differences in the appearance of the face of individuals with Fanconi anemia may be how much those bones of the face grow or don't grow. And um, that may be due to lack of local hormones as well as the serum hormones and, and then specific bone abnormalities uh, of how they listen to the growth hormone or to the hormones. Um, and again, uh, whether it's DNA breakage or other um, signaling abnormalities related to Fanconi anemia hasn't really been um, sorted out. But as it impacts the long bones, we think it also impacts the growth of um, the other types of bones that make up the, the skull and the face and the, and the hips. Um, when we look at the research that has been done in individuals with Fanconi anemia to help understand um, why they may be at increased risk of uh, hormone abnormalities. One of the studies that was done here at the University of Minnesota, um, published about three years ago, looked at MRIs in 36 children that um, had MRIs for different reasons um, around the time of their transplant or uh, when they were at the University of Minnesota for other um, healthcare reasons. And um, six out of the 36 had, or uh, about 16%, had um, an ectopic post posterior pituitary, which basically, I'll show you a picture in the next slide, basically means that as the pituitary gland was developing, the two pieces of the pituitary, the front half and the back half, didn't come together uh, like they needed to. And um, that relates to whether or not you're getting the signals from the hypothalamus down to the pituitary gland and whether you might have uh, uh, pituitary hormone deficiencies. Um, and 30% or 11 out of 36 actually had uh, the front half of the pituitary that makes growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, pituitary hormone regulators and, or I'm sorry, puberty regulators and the ACTH hormone that part that does all those, makes all those hormones was smaller uh, or very tiny in some individuals. Um, and you can see in the different groups based upon the Fanconi anemia cause, there it was more common in individuals with uh, Fanconi D1, um, but with the anterior pituitary hypoplasia, we saw it more spread out across different types of um, or causes for Fanconi anemia. 
So this is a picture of one of those children in the study, uh, the MRI, an 11 year old girl with uh, um, complement group G. Um, and this is an MRI showing the bright spot is the posterior pituitary gland. Um, up here is the hypothalamus. It sends signals down a stalk to the anterior pituitary. And in this situation, her front half of the pituitary is too small. And the back half ectopic means that it's just in the wrong place. It's supposed to be sitting down here, right next to um, the front half of the pituitary gland. And when this is in the wrong spot, we worry that the stalk that brings the blood vessels down to give the signal to the anterior pituitary is also missing. And that increases the likelihood of um, hormone deficiency. So basically saying that the two parts never got together to be able to communicate. And so um, this shows us that you can have um, an anatomic difference that increases the likelihood of pituitary problems all of the hormones that I mentioned could be affected because of this um, congenital or something this individual was born with, abnormality of how the pituitary developed. And so when we look at that, we say that increases the likelihood of those hormone deficiencies. And even in children where we can see that the pituitary looks like it developed normally, we can still sometimes find hormone deficiencies in those children. But um, when we see a picture like this, it increases the likelihood that there's a problem. Um, how can we help children with Fanconi anemia grow? This is a common question that I get as I uh, meet many families um, with Fanconi anemia before transplant or after transplant. And I think that, you know, whenever we talk about how children grow, parents um, want to know how can they feed their children the right food. And so I, I say here this is an important topic all by itself um, because it would take me more than an hour to <laughs> um, go through uh, the, the different aspects of nutrition that we should think about. And an important component is that um, as individuals with Fanconi anemia are small, their bones are small, their muscles are small, their bodies are small. And so sometimes we're trying to uh, give them more calories to help fatten them up when uh, thinking that that's going to help them grow, but it's, it's just going to help them gain fat and not growth. And so we have to balance that when we're thinking about how do we help kids grow. So nutrition is important, but it may not be the solution when kids aren't growing like we think they should. Next most important is recognizing illnesses or therapies that slow growth. So um, in any child that's not growing well, we have to wonder, is there another problem? Are they not absorbing their nutrition? Do they have a condition that, like celiac disease that makes it difficult to hold on to the nutrition or absorb it from the gut? Um, do they have chronic inflammation? Do they have uh, ongoing um, inflammatory disease or um, a lung problem or uh, infection that is causing problems, that making them not grow well? Are they receiving medication that can slow their growth? And steroids um, are used a lot, glucocorticoids, um, for treatment of graft versus host or other uh, diseases. And unfortunately, they have a major negative impact on how kids grow. And then we have to recognize and treat hormone deficiencies. And that's, that's where I come in and taking care of children with uh, Fanconi anemia. Um, we we wanna look at hypothyroidism and uh, subclinical hypothyroidism has been recognized uh, as a condition that should be treated in individuals with Fanconi anemia because it may be part of why they're not growing well. And that basically means that their TSH is a little bit high their T4 may be on the low side of normal, but giving them an extra dose of thyroid hormone uh, as a pill every day may actually help them grow. Whereas in other children, we might wait till it was more clinically apparent that their levels were way off before we would start treatment. And that's partially because the, the brain may not be sending as much signal as the body needs. Gonadal failure, uh, unfortunately, is common in children with Fanconi anemia, whether they receive transplant or not. There can be abnormalities of 
the testicle or, or ovary and how it makes estrogen or testosterone, um, and uh, as well as the fertility side. So we need to make sure that we're giving those hormones if the body is missing them, because as I mentioned in an earlier slide, it's a part of how kids grow. And then growth hormone deficiency, I'll focus on uh, directly. So this was a paper um, that I was part of in 2014, uh, showing how children respond to growth hormone therapy um, uh, in children that had had bone marrow transplant and were documented to have growth hormone deficiency. And this shows four different children, uh, two boys and two girls, had transplant at different ages. So you can see six, nine, nine, and 11. Um, started growth hormone about two years after the transplant or a year and a half after the transplant. The height standard deviation for all of them was right at the bottom of the curve or below it. And um, uh, their IGF-1 levels were pretty low. So these all demonstrated that they weren't growing very well. They had a growth hormone problem. And so it was decided that replacing that hormone uh, uh, was indicated and that we wanted to see how it would help them grow. Um, we can see that at the end of therapy, and unfortunately for these children, we don't know if they're done growing or if this is just the last time that they were uh, being seen. I mentioned a bone age of 16 and, or 17 for boys, they're done. This boy was 16, um, 12 and a half for a girl. She still has a couple of years left to grow. 17 for a boy, he should be pretty close to done, and 14 for a girl, so she at 15, she'd be done. So they're getting pretty close to being done growing. The height standard deviation when they were last seen, this boy is in the normal range, so above the minus two standard deviation. This girl just at the bottom of the curve, this boy almost average height for the general population, and this girl in the normal range, and so you can see they definitely had some benefit of the treatment. And when we look at the curves in a minute, you can see that the gain in height was better in both of the boys than it was in the girls. And not quite sure why that, that happens, but we can see it in the growth curve. So the, the two boys, we see the growth curves here. This just shows the point where the growth hormone started. Uh, height improved up onto the curve, and then puberty hit and he finished treatment. And finished treatment, and then didn't grow very much after treatment was done and is done treatment at about just under five foot three inches tall. And you can see that this mark here says that his family is grew around the 50th percentile. So he had a good response, but is still gonna be small at the end of therapy. Same for this boy, got up onto the curve with treatment and then finished um, at around uh, five foot seven and should have been closer to five foot 10 based upon his family's genetic potential. Um, the girl had a growth response and got closer to the curve, but then uh, was still on treatment when was last seen. This girl didn't have a lot of response to treatment and then was done, but did reach the bottom of the curve, though she sh should have been above average. So a couple more slides, uh, growth hormone safety. Growth hormone makes all cells grow, both normal and abnormal. So we do worry that if somebody has an active malignancy that we shouldn't give growth hormone to them. And we do recognize that there may be some risk of uh, giving growth hormone to children with Fanconi anemia because of their potential risk for developing new tumors. We think that post-transplant, the risk of blood cancer is very low but we still know from the talk yesterday about squamous uh, carcinoma that they can develop cancers uh, that aren't fixed by transplant. Um, but remember, growth hormone does not turn healthy cells to cancer cells. It's just gonna make all cells grow. It's also unclear how growth hormone received uh, as a child will change the risk of cancer years or decades later. And we do have more than 400,000 patient years of safety data showing no evidence of increased risk in the general population, uh, but very small amount of data in children with Fanconi anemia. And so I, um, I think anytime we talk about growth hormone therapy, we have to have the conversation of, is this right for your child? Do they need it? What are the benefits? What are the risks? 
current studies that I just wanted to throw out that we're working on. Ahmad Reyes is a, a, an assistant professor at, in University of Utah. He just left the University of Minnesota where he was a fellow working with us. Um, and he and I are looking at um, uh, updated response of children to growth hormone treatment at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm working with an uh, epidemiologist at the CDC and Emory named Yao Otto to try and to develop a growth chart for children with Fanconi anemia, which has been funded by FARF. Thank you very much. And uh, we are using data available from the visits the, at the University of Minnesota Masonic Children's Hospital. But if you have growth chart data that you would like to share, um, we may be able to incorporate it if uh, you are able to share that with us um, into our uh, growth chart. Some last minute take home pearls. Um, short stature in children with Fanconi anemia is likely due to impairment of growth at the growth plate, even when the hormones are normal. Um, some children will have pituitary abnormalities that may increase the risk of growth hormone deficiency. Growth hormone doesn't turn healthy cells to cancer, but the safety of growth hormone treatment of children with Fanconi anemia needs to continue to be monitored. And I always throw this in, growth hormone is not a steroid because a lot of people think it is. So I'd be happy to um, uh, answer any questions as, uh, as we wrap up here. Um, this is a cartoon that was, a drawing that was made by the sister of a child with a rare disease that I've uh, been, involved in, been involved with for a long time that says, even if we don't grow right, we are still perfect. And I think it's an important uh, sentiment to uh, uh, think about. Last, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. McMillan and Dr. Wagner um, at the University of Minnesota um, Sonic Children's Kids First Comprehensive Fanconi Anemia Center for getting me involved in taking care of children with FA and uh, to uh, encourage me to be part of the Camp Sunshine uh, group and hope that uh, next year I can actually see what Camp Sunshine looks like since I've never been to Maine. <laughs> and this is my contact information uh, for, for people if they have questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. And we hope you make it there too. We hope we all make it there next year. We all yeah. miss it, I think. Yep. Um, very informative and interesting uh, presentation. It looks like we have some questions. So Jordan will go ahead and get those going. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, our first question is by Lisa and it's uh, regarding scoliosis. So I'll just read it. It says, do you have any experience with scoliosis and or spine growth issues with FA patients? Uh, I've recently noticed what I will call bad posture in my 13 pre-puberty year old son with FA, uh, a bit of a hunch in his shoulders and neck. Um, I've not had the opportunity to consult with his doctor on this yet, but I'm wondering whether this could be related to FA or just a function of too much screen time. <laughs> Especially with COVID, right? right. Um, so when we think about scoliosis, it is increased in children with uh, um, Fanconi anemia. We worry about both the curve of the spine uh, in the up and down uh, direction as well as in the forward direction. So some people are actually hunched forward and uh, one is called scoliosis uh, if the spine is like an S and kyphosis is when you're bending forward too much. Um, and so uh, there is an increased risk of it in children with Fanconi anemia. So if you're seeing a change, it's good at your regular visits with your pediatrician uh, or your FA specialist to have them examine the back and decide whether it's beneficial to do x-rays of, of the spine to in investigate it. Um, the more severe it is, they, they sometimes do bracing, um, obviously trying to help kids sit up straight as well. And then uh, some are severe enough to actually need surgery. Growth hormone can make scoliosis worse if it's present just because it's growing, it's promoting growth in the curved direction. Um, so we are very careful and watch kids that have scoliosis if we're treating with growth hormone um, to monitor that over time as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, can you also comment on vitamin D supplementation guidelines and kind of in tandem with that, um, is iodine supplementation necessary for thyroid treatment? 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll do the iodine first. Um, iodine is important for thyroid function. Um, the main hormone made by the thyroid is called T4, and it literally means that there are four iodines attached to the hormone to get it to do its job. And at the local tissue, it pulls off one of those iodines to make T3 that does actually does the work at the, at the cell. And so your body definitely needs iodine to uh, have your thyroid function properly. Um, in the United States, we don't need iodine supplementation in general because we have it added to, uh, we have iodized breads and other things um, that sodium iodide is added to. Um, but it's very important not to be on a low iodine diet because then you're not going to get enough. On the other end of the spectrum, we can give too much iodine and actually shut the thyroid down. So it's important on both, both sides that we're not giving too little and not too much. Same is true for vitamin D. Um, I live in Minnesota where the sunshine, even today when it burnt my skin, um, is probably in general not as good as we think it is for activating our vitamin D in our skin. And so we need supplements in Minnesota. Um, iodine is important for bone health, for calcium metabolism, and for the immune system. And so making sure that kids have enough iodine is important. Um, the recommendations for iodine have changed recently in terms of the amount that, that kids can get, and they've also recently changed the units. So we used to say 400 units a day was enough. And now I think that's 10 micrograms. I always have to look at the, look at the label to make sure that I've got it right. Um, but in general, uh, that would be for an infant uh, or up to school age. And then um, it would be about 1,000, 800 to 1,000 until puberty, and then uh, 1 to 2,000 for an adult-sized person. And so, um, and again, that would be 25 is the 1,000 and 50 is the 2,000 just to, with the new units. And so I recommend for all of our patients in Minnesota or who come to Minnesota, I say take, take 1 to 2,000 units every day. Um, we used to think uh, that vitamin D could be toxic if you took too much of it um, because it's fat soluble and it's still true, but you have to get a lot of it for it to actually cause problems. And so for most, most people, if they're just taking a, a daily multivitamin, it's hard to get too much vitamin D or, or even the one or 2000 unit supplements. Great, thank you so much. And just kind of in tandem with the thyroid question, what are the implications for FA patients who have elevated thyroid hormone levels? And what are the risks or complications of this? What are the treatments to get this back to normal? Yeah, so I briefly mentioned the subclinical hypothyroidism in, this, in the talk. And um, we're not 100% sure that you have to treat subclinical thyroid disease. So, um, what that means is if your TSH, the normal range for TSH goes up in most assays to four or five. And um, if the TSH goes above that, it's telling the, the brain is saying, I'm not getting enough thyroid hormone to the brain, so I need to send more signal to the thyroid to work harder and make more thyroid hormone. And so if your TSH is six, then your body is saying, I need more, but I'm keeping up right now. The, the amount that the thyroid is making is doing okay. We think that if the TSH goes above 10, that you've, you've run out of room to uh, keep up. And especially if the thyroid hormone itself falls under the normal range, then you definitely have developed a, a thyroid problem. Once you develop a thyroid problem, the, the long-term health uh, components are you don't grow well, you gain weight, you are cold all the time, you have difficulty concentrating and, and performing like you should. When you're in the subclinical range, we're not really sure that you're, even in the long run, that you're gonna have a negative outcome from not getting the thyroid hormone. But as I mentioned, especially in kids that are growing, we found that giving it back helps them grow a little bit better. 
Um, so basically you're trying to get them into the normal range like, like most kids are. Um, and if you don't give thyroid hormone in babies, um, you actually affect how the brain develops up to about age three. Um, if your thyroid hormone is deficient, it, it can cause brain damage. Um, so, you know, growth, brain damage, and then long-term metabolism, bone health. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, Rena Rice has a question that she'd like to ask and her hand is raised. So she'll be unmuted and she can ask you directly. Great. Hi, Mrs. Rice. I don't hear. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Hi from California. We saw you in February with Blake and Wright, Blake and Sydney. Yes. Um, I was waiting for you to say that because I'm not allowed. Okay. <laughs> you have a lot of patience, but um, we were just there. You can't forget us. Well, um, I, I don't forget. I don't forget you. I'm just saying I'm not allowed to say who you are or who your kids are. Uh, got it. Um, <laughs> Privacy. <laughs> that's funny. Um, no, I was just, just when you were talking about kyphosis and scoliosis, I saw the comment earlier, and it makes me think of Blake. He's 20. Mm -hmm. um, when he was younger, I, there was no notice, noticeable sign of any back structural stuff. Not that he wasn't eventually going to get a little bit of it, but he was on growth hormones, I think, up to five years. So yeah. in my mind, I think, oh, that definitely contributed. But who knows the risk versus, you know, I mean, he's 5'9", doing great. But um, at the time, he might have been he was at the very end of growth when we saw an orthopedic person and they said, you know what, if he was 13, I'd look at it a little differently, but because he's at the end, not much more can happen. But I don't, I know this isn't your expertise, but um, do you have thoughts on, he's 20. I, again, I want to poke my finger in his back and tell him to straighten up. Um, <laughs> but I've heard from older people that say, oh, you should really do exercises, things like this will only get worse. So he's, he's 20, he's not on growth hormone, and he seems, they said it was 10%. Yeah. They say kyphos is 10%, but then that was the end of that. I haven't seen him since. Any thoughts on what to do going forward? Yeah, so in general, when we think about kyphosis, as the orthopedist said early, um, if he was 13, they might have intervened because they would worry that it could be getting worse over time because the, the spine would still be growing. And so the the likelihood of it bending more forward was more. Um, whereas if they're seeing it when he's done growing, they're saying it's probably not gonna change very much until he's much older. Um, and when they decide in terms of bracing in kids, the bracing is trying to help things stay in place so they grow straight and then seal that way. Uh, but once the bones are done growing, uh, aside from surgery, there's nothing to do that would um, totally straighten it out. I don't know if exercises would have any benefit, a small amount of benefit or a lot, um, but I think an orthopedist would be the person who would be able to say that. And I think they would in general say it could help a little, but, but probably not a lot because I think it's structurally like the bricks standing up on a, in a pile You've got one brick at the top or a couple of bricks at the top there that are a little um, crooked and um, you can't do anything to get them to straighten back up to, to, to fix that other than, like you said, sit up straight. Um, Makes sense. I, I heard you mention bra braces, but that might be when they're younger to wear a brace. Yes. Yeah, so the bracing is definitely something that uh, orthopedists use during the times of rapid growth. Uh, in children to try and help keep the bones so that as they're solidifying the edges of the bone as they're growing, that they grow as a straight brick rather than a crooked brick. And um, uh, so that that's why they would say, I can't or I wouldn't do anything now, A, because the spine is almost done growing or is done growing, or and B, because, um, you know, a surgery would be a big deal to try and straighten it out that might not actually change how he feels. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, of course. Great, thank you. Um, 
Okay, so does bone marrow transplant affect um, the endocrine system and or fertility issues? So I, I apologize. I felt like I was running out of time, so I didn't slow down and talk about the impact of bone marrow transplant, both on growth and endocrine systems. Um, but, but the answer to both is yes. Um, if you receive radiation as part of your transplant, um, it's usually total body radiation, which is affecting all of the growth plates, and it probably slows growth a little, not a bunch, but a little. The, the more radiation you receive, the more likely it affects the hypothalamus sending signals to make growth hormone, and so it increases the risk of growth hormone deficiency. And then um, chemotherapy that you receive tends to damage the thyroid first, and the higher the doses of the chemotherapy, the more it affects fertility and uh, um, gonadal function. And so um, in children with Fanconi anemia, the gonadal function is, can be damaged uh, without any transplant because of the, the condition itself, but transplant chemotherapy and radiation increase that risk. Um, so it makes it harder for children um, to be fertile or to have normal gonadal function uh, post-transplant. Um, the other thing that happens post-transplant is you develop, you have an increased risk of developing autoimmune conditions like the body attacking the thyroid gland so that it can't do its job. So you've got a triple whammy. You've got the thyroid may not work 100% because you have Fanconi anemia or it may not be getting all of the signal that, that it needs you have a chemotherapy damage to the thyroid, and then you have the new immune system may think that the thyroid looks foreign and attacks it. So there are a lot of different reasons, which is important to continue to monitor thyroid function um, long-term. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question about pituitary abnormalities. So with the pituitary, pituitary abnormality is found with the MRI review that you showed. How do those percentages compare with the general population? So um, it was 11% for the ectopic posterior pituitary and about 30% for anterior uh, pituitary hypoplasia. Um, those would each be one in a thousand uh, or less in the general population. And um, I have to say that this study um, focused on transplanted children because they were being, in general, they had MRIs because they were looking for a potential complication of transplant called PRESS, which is uh, encephalopathy that can be a transplant complication. So this may not reflect what's true in all individuals with Fanconi anemia because not everybody needs a transplant. Um, and uh, because of this, we've actually started doing MRIs in children early on when they're identified with Fanconi anemia to look to see if they have a pituitary problem. And that will give us more information about, is it really 10 or 30% or is it more like five and 15 or something like, something like that? But it's definitely something to investigate. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, so we have a question about head size. Does um, small head size af affect an FA patient's learning? So um, that's it's a difficult question to answer because we see some children with um, Fanconi anemia who have learning challenges and we see others who do not. And they're, um, in the general population, your head size is related to um, learning capacity, if it's very, very small or very, very large, you're more likely to have learning problems. Um, but within a normal range, we can have a lot of variation in head size that doesn't directly affect uh, your learning. So I would say the smaller it is, the more likely it impacts learning, but it's not consistent for everybody. Great, thank you so much. I think that uh, concludes our Q&A. Um, we're running out of time, but are you available on Slack for people to post questions for you? Absolutely. 
Great, that sounds good. And any questions that we get on Slack, um, you know, if they don't get addressed later on or something, I can forward them to you and that's okay. Perfect. Great. Yes. Cool. Thank you for in involving me. Thank you so much for being here with us. Mm -hmm.